thing. So working from home and, and, and participating in a digital uh, environment with 24-7 of a day has a negative psychological consequence on, on the human being. But Ask why did, why did we accept it? Why did we accept it? Why, why are we so accepting now? We don't, uh, well, we just can, give our kids only... a phone and, and, and we say, fine, be on, be on the phone 24-7. But, but, but we're accepting. You can only accept something when somebody asks the question. Uh, we stopped asking questions. So yeah. it's, not, it's not even about accepting. You can only accept something when there's something to accept. If no one asks the question, there's no acceptance. You know, it just happens. It's sort of organic. It just evolves. And I think this is the problem. Sometimes we get ahead of ourselves. We don't think about the results. We just go ahead and off we go because there's other more important reasons. Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, so we don't stop and challenge anymore. We, we go. Yes, and there's an odd voice in the wilderness going, ah, oh, I think we do. But in general, uh, um, uh, society just goes with the majority. And it's like backpackers bias. As soon as someone sees on this internet that there's a hundred people saying the sky is blue, all of a sudden everybody believes the sky is blue. It doesn't matter if the hundred people are wrong. Yeah. Hi everyone and welcome to today's video. I have with me as usual Paul Morley. Paul, I hope you're doing quite well today. Uh, Tev, as always, I think uh, yeah, it's been a tough couple of weeks. In fact, it's been a tough year so far, but yes, uh, all things being equal, yeah, doing well, doing well, getting there, getting to where we have to go. Good to hear. So we have viewers a very interesting topic uh, that we've put together for you today that I hope you will find extremely interesting. It, it covers um, a variety of topics. Now, what it's all about, let me start by talking about our current situation. So the start to this decade has been interesting and extremely difficult, something that none of us uh, foresaw coming. We've had two years or just over two years of a global pandemic. We've got an energy crisis, an inflation crisis, we have a new war. I mean, who thought that in 2022 we'd still have wars? We thought that society, you know, would progress past a lot of these things with all the technology that we have. And yet here we are. There's a problem. But what is the problem? Right. Um, are we not applying the technology that we have correctly? Are we not finding real solutions uh, to the problems that we have, are we creating a society of people who just consume quick answers from devices like these without using the brain properly? So in part one of our series, which is this, we're going to start with lateral thinking. Okay. What is lateral thinking? Well, my definition, and we'll get Paul's definition in a, in a second. Lateral thinking is basically thinking outside the box, not just searching for an answer and consuming it and accepting it as uh, a, you know, a fact. Uh, it's something that in this generation uh, where people are glued to social media, where people find it very easy to just use a search engine, it feels like even though we have so much great technology, this is something that we've lost. So at this point, I'm going to now bring Paul in and let's set the scene first starting with some of the problems um, that, that, that we see. So Paul, I've given my uh, view, you know, my definition of lateral thinking. It sounds like it's a very important skill that's missing from society today. Uh, yes, and I think there's a number of reasons why it's missing and, and, and uh, a lot of it's got to do with how we brought up and how we educated. We we, we we society draws us in a particular direction and uh, and you grow up learning things in a particular within a certain framework of things and uh, i think to a large degree a lot of our modern educational systems and institutions have taken away the ability to some degree for individuals to develop their own uh, uh, curiosity as such if you might put it this way they it's 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 almost it's railroaded down a particular path with very little uh, um, tolerance to look outside or left or right. Give you an example. Uh, a lot of our education systems um, have been developed where the outcome is rewarded. 
Yeah. Okay, you reward the outcome. Okay, uh, and there's a certain way you get to the outcome. But but the funny thing, the fascinating thing is, um, as in mathematics, uh, there are many ways to solve a single problem. So you can solve the problem many different ways, four or five ways. I mean, uh, a three plus two is five. One plus four is five. Uh, 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 two plus two plus one is five. So they automatically, just as a, a, a very easy example, you have three different ways to get to the same answer. Now, yeah. a lot of our a lot of our institutions uh, uh, um, focus on the outcome uh, uh, and not the process to the outcome. So, which means there's only one way to solve the problem. They yeah. expect the answer to be X, uh, and they want to see how you got to X, and and that's why you have these formulas and, and you go through school. You remember high school? You go through all these, yeah. and they and they and they look at the process and they look at your framework on how you got to the answer, then the market correct or incorrect. But how many times? How many? So think about it this way: if if for example, instead of rewarding the outcome. In, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a test, rather reward the student on how many different ways he got to the answer. So, so you don't reward him because there's the answer. Give him the answer. Give the student yeah. the answer and say, right, how many different ways can you get to that answer if you know the answer? And I think you and me have spoken this a bit before, and it's got a lot to do with you know, this new concept of, of sort of quantum thinking and, 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 and thinking about more than one possibility existing at the same time. And uh, how, do you, how do you handle that paradox of, of uh, two things in the, same, in the same space at the same time? Or, or, you know, and, and I think that is, that is sort of where, we, we've, where our education has gone. We've, yeah. we've, we've lost the creativity. So, because a creative mind, like your artists, your poets, your musicians, uh, they're the ones who think that side. Because there's no boundaries to music. So, a, a music is an open, an open space. Pa a painting is an open canvas. And, and the artist is free to explore with whatever he wants. And that sort of uh, um, builds and generates and evolves your, your creative side, which is, which is allowing you to think outside of, of a, a, a stereotypical sort of uh, direction of thought or direction of education, and and I think for for me that's one of the biggest the biggest issues we have in modern society is we've taught society to think one way, where we should be teaching society people in society to think many different ways. Uh, we're sort of getting into this cookie cutter mode, you know, and we see it in business all the time. We see it in our politics. We see it in our religion. We see it in our, our global conflicts. It's cookie cutter. It's the same thing, the same thing, and and people are saying, yeah, but history just repeats itself. Well. Clearly, because it's the cookie cutter. It's a, it's the so, whole notion of re replicating the same thing over and over and over again. So this is what I want to get to, right? What types of problems we can solve if we perhaps take a look at ourselves and uh, ask the question, are we applying a more creative way of thinking like the, the artist and the painter to other other problems, both in society and, and in the corporate space, right? And, and the example I, I mentioned at the beginning is that even though we have such advanced technology now, we have AI and, and data science, um, we've seen in recent years, and it's got nothing to do with the technology, the technology is great, but we've seen people struggle to, to use this technology to get to meaningful answers. And uh, we, we need to look outside of technology to find out why that's happening. Let's start though with some of the problems, right? So what are some of the problems you see uh, in, in the corporate space and, and, and in the world where it's come about as a result of us uh, creating this society of drones and not thinkers? Well, I, I think just to go, here's my view. It's, it, it's fine being a society of thinkers, but we also need to be a, a society of philosophers. Uh, and this is my perspective around science and art. This is the, the, the science is the thinkers, the art of the philosophers, uh, and, and you need a balance between these two. And there's a reason why the, the, a PhD is called a PhD, a, a bachelor in, in philosophy, because it's, it stems back through history to the, the ancient Greek time. So philosophy was the cornerstone to a lot of, uh, of technical advances in, 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 in prehistory. Uh, um, but it was centered around the philosophy, understanding the possibilities understanding the probabilities, understanding the what-ifs. That is what a philosophy does. It explores the, 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 the hard 
technology that the and they try and unpack it to understand what that effect would be in society what effect and and, and the greeks did it very very well i mean they spent half half their lives philosophizing what, what is a philosopher a, 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 these 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 big ph philosophical meetings are going well there were debates they were debating about new technology they were debating about certain things and they had open forum debates sometimes for years about a new piece of technology or a new idea before they eventually accepted it, but, and, but rolled it and, 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 and inculcated it in the, in the society. We don't debate they, anymore. We, we just but accept. That's the point. Yeah. Well, that's the point. We we don't talk about the impacts around of, of technology. We don't talk about the the, the, the negative side effects of, of having a highly digital world. What is what is a, a, on 24-7 B? And we've seen it now coming through COVID where the, the, the stress and depression has now increased almost, you know, dramatically over this period. Why? Because there's a fundamental change in, in, in our human behavior and uh, it's had a negative effect. So working from home and, and, and participating in a digital uh, environment for 24-7 of a day has a negative psychological consequence on, on the human being. But Ask why did, me, why did we through. accept Why did we accept it? Why, why are we so accepting now? We don't, uh, well, we just can, give our kids only... a phone and, and, and we say, fine, be on, be on the phone 24-7. But, but, but we're accepting. You can only accept something when somebody asks the question. So if I ask you, you know, what's your view? You either accept my view or don't accept my view. We're not accepting because we're not asking the question. As soon as someone sees on this internet that there's 100 people saying the sky is blue, all of a sudden everybody believes the sky is blue. It doesn't matter if the 100 people are wrong. Yeah. yeah. You know, they believe, they believe popular opinion. Uh, and again, this ties directly back into our business around hype. What is hype? Well, hype is a, hype is generated by many people saying something. Therefore, it must be something. Uh, and so, our, our society is becoming very ingrained with this type of behavior, hype, and and the masses and what the masses say, and not speaking to the and not having the debate around the individual questions. And and and, and this is what's causing us a lot of dissonance. Uh, uh, you know, uh, or you know, this lethargy we see in civilization at the moment. I mean, I'll give you an example. There's another example. Uh, a scientific invention, uh, uh, they've measured it over the last 100 years, is going down. So, so yes, while there's a lot of progress and there's a lot of evolution in technology, invention is going down. How do they measure this? Well, well they measure it by uh, uh, look, looking at all the research papers in the world that go to the Nobel laureates uh, and, and the various scientific institutions. They take all of these white papers in these research papers, and then they analyze the words. And what they do in the words is they search for unique words. Uh, a unique nouns. Now, a unique noun is a unique idea. So you, you'll find a guy coming up with, he's just invented, I don't know, electromagnetism. But the word, but he applies a unique word to his, his, right. his discovery. So it's, it's a unique word. He, he, he describes these, his discovery with a unique word that hasn't been done before. So that's a unique word. So we see, we see white papers and presentations of unique words in scientific papers being published going down. But what we've seen on the increase is dual uh, um, uh, words going up. So, so these are words that they've taken two things that were originally uh, in isolation of each other and joined them together. So Very think of it this way. You have the theory of magnetism. You have, you have magnetism, the theory, which is a unique word. Uh, uh, then you have electricity, another unique word. And now you join the two together. Now you have electromagnetism. So that's what I'm talking about. The, the, the dual singularity of the words are going up, but the unique ones are going down. So we see very little original idea and far more growth in, in, in sort of the meshing of ideas, bringing together ideas, uh, okay, uh, which is quite strange. I'll come back to that. That's very interesting, and I didn't know that. However, I want to go back to this. A societal problem that you mentioned in, in, in spite of all the technology we have where, where people aren't creative thinkers anymore and and the digital uh, over, over you know um, uh, flood that is hitting especially younger people is making it worse the question is if nothing changes and there's just going to be more digital interactions what are some of the problems that are that will emerge down the line in the next 10 20 years well, that's that's a very good question. I think this is a very dangerous space. And again, I don't think there's enough thought about this because I do, in my opinion, um, starting to see a, a civilization um, uh, um, disinteract with each other. So we're going to become we're going to become distant upon one another. We 
because of this this digital barrier we have between this digital culture now we've created between us uh, 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 we're going to become distant from one another. We're going to become less empathetic uh, uh, because, you know, and, and it's, it's the same thing. It's easy to push a button and drop a nuclear bomb in Hiroshima and kill 20 million people. Vastly different thing to going out and giving the guy a knife and saying, right, then you go down the road and go and stab every single one of those individuals while they're looking you in the eye. Vastly different. So there's there's no personal interaction anymore. There's no there's no empathic tie, and I see this becoming a problem, okay, because we're going to lose that level of, of engagement, uh, uh, and it's going to become just dry and devoid. People are not going to care about each other anymore, necessarily, because we've lost this connection with one another, and, and it's easy just to push a button. I mean, you know, you see video games today. You see, you see how the modern digital world is interacting with both young, old, and, and middle age. It's, it's push the button stuff. So we're mm. training our minds. We are slowly cooking our minds to a perspective of we where we're going to lose a lot of that humanity, that emotion, that 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 ties a civilization together. Uh, you're just going to become blank blank people that are just worried about yourself. Well, well that's and, well that's interesting because I, I interviewed a guy called Dale Deacon. Uh, he's been in the virtual reality and now metaverse space, and we spoke about how uh, we had violent video games, but we all played video games and you know, it didn't affect us. But now. With, you know, in the metaverse with your headset on, it's going to feel so real. And the kids growing up with it, uh, it's going to feel like you're really there and you're really uh, killing someone, but it's it's detached. Uh, it's not emotional anymore. Well, and that's, uh, that's, that's the problem. That's yeah. the problem. Okay. Uh, and, and you're going to see far more of that. Um, and how does that affect just day-to-day -day things? Like how do you interact with your staff at the office? Do you care? How do you build a, a social culture? How do you build an organizational culture? How do you develop a winning culture uh, and get that esprit de corps? You get that passion. You get that pride. You get that building that back into your organization. How do you do that? I, I, hey, I, you, you, I, you've raised something that I've never heard before, and I think I think it's important. Have staff interactions been impacted and become less human? Because we're just interacting virtually now. We're sitting at home of and course, interacting. Of, of, of course. Why, of course, yes. Why do you think we work longer hours offline than we do in the office? Because we've lost that personal connection. Now it's just too easy to push a button and boof, you've got a meeting. Yeah. You've, you've, there's no effort anymore. There's no consequence of effort. If I was working at the office and I wanted to go and have a meeting with someone, I'd have to get up off my desk, potentially drive a, a, a bus to another building to have a meeting and then come back. That's effort. You have to make effort to do that. It's it's there's a there's a there's a cost to having a meeting. Uh, 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 now there's no cost to having a meeting. I can have as many meetings as I want. There's no time interval. There's no uh, expenditure of energy. There's no there's no expenditure of of emotional no, but uh, also, um, um, feeling. But but also, if I needed to convince you as Paul of something, we're working on something uh, in the corporate space. There's a big difference if I'm sitting face to face uh, across a desk. And, and and doing it, you know, like we're doing it now over, over a video call. Because body language plays a big role in the boardroom. 90% of a negotiation in a boardroom is body language and, and behavior, not, not, not the verbal communication. But. So good negotiators, very little of the, 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 the communication is done through, through the, the verbal means. A lot of the communication is done through body language, posture and behavior. And so, so you lose that connection. Now what happens? Is somebody that used to be very good and relied on that a lot, now he's put in a situation where he's lost seven, potentially 70% of his, of his ability because that, that aspect has now been taken away from him. Now he only re relies on, on a verbal communication, which was 30% um, of, 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 the, of the thing. So now, now he's at a disadvantage. So there's sut subtle things like that that changes the power and dynamics in an organization. <coughs> Yeah. That require human human contact, require human interaction. When you lose that level of, of, of interaction and, and contact, you start changing the nuances of an organization. The power levels start shifting. And, and, and those are the things that, that'll, that'll spread into the broader society at some point. I mean, that's a typical example. But imagine a society behaving like that. Imagine, you know, it's, it's, it, it'll be catastrophic. So let's do a bit of a recap, right? Because... Um... If, if, if you've been listening you know, from the beginning, uh, the viewers, this is about technology. This is about uh, you know, data science uh, and, and AI and all the new technology coming. 
and the fact that we still have so many problems and, and we're anticipating more problems coming down the line just due to, to where we're evolving to, okay? So we're going to touch on all of that in a second. But what we have established thus far is that uh, we're becoming less uh, personal, less human almost, uh, the deeper we go into the digital world, number one. And number two, it's very easy. I think we have a generation of kids that don't question the answer they get from a search engine or from a, from an article on the internet. And that's uh, causing us as a society to lose that creative skill. And there will be an impact to that, right? So before we get into lateral thinking, lateral thinking is the core topic of this video. To tackle everything that we've, that we've uh, mentioned thus far, what are some of the, the, the ways we turn the ship around? What skills do we need to teach young people, especially those entering the workforce nowadays? Uh, well, there's a number of skills that, that, that we want to focus on specifically. When you, especially when children are very, very early in age, focus a lot on the, on the creative dimensions and arts uh, because it develops certain pathways in the brain that, that helps you in later life. Keep the curio curiosity going in a child. I mean, we've all got kids. We've all had kids. And, I, and, I, and all the parents I've spoken to, fathers and mothers, yeah, where their children got to around seven or eight years old, um, and, I, and, you know, and I replayed the story. They're like, do you remember the time when your kid came up to you and asked you, why, Dad, why is the sun yellow? And then you say the sun's yellow because it's a fire. Yeah, but dad, what's a fire? Why is there a fire? And, and as every answer that you give to your, your, your child, he comes back with another why, another why, another why, another why, another why. Another. And it used to drive me insane. And I, and I assume it used to drive most parents insane because this kid just kept on whining. And they're like, well, but what, the, what, what is that child doing? The child fundamentally is exploring. Okay, he's asking. There's a there's an innate curiosity there, uh, and the child is exploring the the directions and understandings in his environment. This is why it's important, you know, uh, and uh, to ask why all the time. And you, you Tab, you've known me for many years. I'm I'm big on why. Uh, why? 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 Why that? Why this? Question everything. Yeah. And, and there's there's that link back into philosophy, uh, the philosophers of old. Why? And it doesn't matter if you're right, and it doesn't matter if you're wrong. But continue probing your reality, and 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 your and your and your surroundings with why. Probe it. Don't accept it. Probe it because you might find something in that process that you never knew existed before, or you were not aware of that can enhance yeah. uh, your, or something that was very potentially very dangerous that could have potentially uh, harmed you greater than you know. So so that skill, and, and, and then we get to a point in a child's age, and all of a sudden the child stops asking why. They, it's funny that, because they only go through this period of about three or four years where they whine, they irritate everybody. But yeah. at some point they stop asking why. Now, because I'm a curious guy, I wanna know why. Why is that? Why do children stop asking why? Well, well, they start it, but then they just go for a certain period, they just stop. And it's all got to do with a certain uh, um, uh, age. Uh, and from what I've uh, heard and, and speaking to various parents about this, it normally happens at about 11 years old. But, but why 11? What's so fascinating about that age? And then you start getting into this educational question we've just debated. The, how is the modern education and the modern sort of society and structure of how we teach people shaping the way we think? And taking away some of the fundamentals that we had. Now, I'm not saying that's the only reason, believe me, but it's, it is, there is certainly a, a, a cause and effect there. There's, a, there's definitely a cause and effect there. And, and, and for one minute, I'm not saying that's the problem. And I'm not saying education is always the problem, but it, it's, there, there, is a, there is a connection there. And, and, and for some reason, we stop asking why when we're very young. And yeah. uh, and we and I've only learned that in recent history, in the last four or five years. I've now started to say why more often than I ever did. Uh, and, and it's taken me down a journey of learning and a journey of understanding that is that is second to none because because that curiosity is there now uh, uh, and you ask why you find out why you learn why understand these things and 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 you'll be surprised a difference that makes your perspective uh, in, in in your world uh, it changes your perspective on business changes your perspective on a, a global politics and positioning. So, so this this little exercise called why is is a, and the curiosity and and continue probing your context. And I think that's one of the skills you have to teach. Uh, yeah. uh, cycling back to ask me is you've got to keep teaching your children to ask why and interrogate the the reality, interrogate the situation, interrogate what they hear uh, and what others say. 
they've got to interrogate because it is going to become more and more difficult to ex to extract the truth out of the digital domain uh, into the real world than it has ever been. There's a lot of fake media. There's a lot of yeah, cyber counterfeiting. Yeah. There's a lot of political um, noise making. So how much do you see in the digital domain is actually truthful or not? You've got to learn skills as a human to determine what the truth is out of all this noise, to find the signal in the noise. And, and one of the ways you, you, you must teach your kids or, or you, you know, teach the future generation is teach them to have this curiosity and ask why and interrogate everything they see. Because yeah. the only way they can defend against this monotony of white noise that we see in, 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 in the digital uh, domain is, is you've got to find the signal in the noise. Lots of static but what's the signal? You've got to teach them to hear for the signal, and 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 that is why one of the things I would you know I would I would say and, and I would uh, you know punch well, very hard. You is, remember is the the famous uh, book by Simon Sinek, Start with Why, which was a motivational thing that helped people figure out why they why why they wake up in the morning and why they do what they do. Yes. So, uh, Purpose. I mean, but here's a question now. So, coming back to uh, the topics we normally talk about, which is technology economics and and you know the corporate world uh, can we say that societies that get this right that that foster more creative thinking as well as organizations that get their people to be more i can't remember remember if it's left brain or, or right brain that's more creative uh, but but the more creative one will they start pulling ahead and and gaining advantages uh, irrespective of technological advantages, because we've seen with, with data science and machine learning, techno the technology is great. It doesn't answer all the questions. You still need the human creativeness to, to, to figure out how to use it. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm seeing over the last few years. So are there advantages to be gained and, and will they be gained um, by adopting this as a cultural thing? Well, we'll look back at history to we'll ask you a question. Go and ask the ancient Greeks. Did it work for them? Did it, did, it, did, did it work for the Romans? Ask them. Let me tell you, between the Greeks and the Romans, everything we have today that you see around you, Tab, be it your language, be it your science, be it your mathematics, be it your religion, be it your politics, be it your law, all originates from, from, the, from the Greeks and the Romans. Ask yourself that question. What has this generation or this period of our civilization left i was i was going to add i was going to add the ancient indians but you're talking more about the period yeah, yeah but, but, but it's, 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 <laughs> i had it's, to it's 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 it's, it's I, I could say the same about the the japanese and the chinese i mean yeah. you, know, you have to give it to, to the ancient civilizations they did something that we are not doing okay yes, and everything and, and everything we know today everything that we've built a foundation on today is is from that from the the gauge of a troll the railway track why is the gauge of a of, of a train so wide why because that is the gauge from romian chariots and in ancient britain formed uh, pathways in in the stone which was that wide and if they wanted to they had to make the 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 the, the woodworkers and the and and, and the, the steel the steel had to make those things that way because they made chariots so guess what you inherit all these uh, little pieces of technology and ideas and they evolve through time. Writing from the from 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 the Greeks, from the the, the Chinese, um, mathematics from the Chinese again, uh, um, etc. Astronomy from from the Indians and the Aztecs. So so you you inherit all these things, but there is something that they have fundamentally got right that we're not doing today. And the question is, what is that? Yeah. And the question that these societies were very. Uh, artistic and curious in nature. So they, they all have one common thing, okay? Be it the Aztecs, the Indians, the, the Greeks, the Romans. If you look at their cultures, they're very artistical cultures. They, they've got a lot of art. They've got a lot of creativity. They they promoted creativity. Uh, so the, 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 the Japanese in, in the samurai, if you look at the samurai, uh, very few of the, of the samurai skills are warfare skills. A lot of the samurai skills have got to do with art, calligraphy, painting, music. So, so, so a lot of those ancient cultures <clears throat> embedded a lot of their time and spent a lot of their time in, in the fields of, of the arts. And the arts became the science because, you know, and, and, and people also forget that, like, uh, art – Art became science. And science, by the way, science, as we know today, is only three or four hundred years old. Science is not an old thing. 
Okay, science is a relatively relatively new thing. Yeah. Uh, it's but about but Paul, years but old. Paul, let me bring economics into the argument. <laughs> is it not that we have this problem because we've created a society where if I'm an artist, be it musical or painting, I'm probably going to be penniless. So I, I, I'd rather come and work for a bank and become a mindless drone that doesn't think, but hey, I, I can get a salary every month. Is that not part of the problem? It is part, but there are, there are unique ways of uh, overcoming that, <laughs> that challenge. Let's take a look at our, uh, our famous scientists, our, our, our uh, theorists, Einsteins, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Newton's, uh, Aristotle. All of them were both philosophers and scientists. They were both. Einstein was a, a philosopher and he was well known for his science and his scientific theories, very well known, but not very well known for his philosophies and his ideas about life. Same with Newton, same with all of them. So, so you can't be one, and that's the, this, is the, this is the point to answer your question. You can't be one or the other, uh, right. Tav. You've got to be both. You have to develop both the art and the science to be successful. One, you can't have successful science without art. I mean, ask uh, uh, Steve Jobs around Apple. But right. his, his biggest claim to fame was the art, not the science. So, so that's, the, that's so, the best example in the modern world, I guess, of how yeah. he married the two to make technology perhaps appealing. A I balance, guess. a yeah. perfect balance. And, and he was always chasing the balance. He was chasing the efficiency. He was chasing the, um, 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 the aesthetic. minimal effort for the aesthetic. And, 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 and for him, it was all about the calligraphy. Of, of the item of, of his of his technology and 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 it becomes the balance and yes it's difficult but you can't and and this is what the problem i have with stem today everybody's focusing on the stem things and now yeah. they're going to increase it and everybody's excluding the arts i'm like guys you can't they're all equally important there's a balance to these things they're all inter they're all uh, they're all reliant on each other they are, you can't you can't have maths without art art without and it might sound it might sound strange but at the end of the day it's true all of these things are intertwined they they're all part of a collective same thing they're all part of the same thing they're different dimensions they're different views and perspectives but at the end of the day they're all interconnected okay you can't sacrifice one for the other you've got to look at the collective you've got to look at the, whole, the holistic picture and that also comes back now to when we start, start talking about lateral thinking you can't just talk about banking You've got, to, you've got to understand banking and manufacturing and uh, aeronautics and uh, socioeconomic impacts and retail. Uh, the, and retail. You, you can't just think about one dimension anymore. One dimension uh, thinking or one dimensional thinking like that is you're going to die. Now it becomes this, this, this you've now got to look uh, 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 and, and accept the, the collective. And that's coming out with our skills developed as well, with the specialists, the generalists, and the situationists. Which I know we'll get into a little bit later. We'll, we'll, we'll get into. Let, let's do a let's do a quick recap. We've covered a lot, right? So we we've established that one of the problems in modern society is that uh, well, the creative aspect has gone, and we're not incentivizing it to come back. Um, and if we thought previously it's fine, it's not a problem. We have so much technology today. Well, no, the, the even with the technology, we're not solving uh, uh, the problems because we, as you mentioned. A lot of uh, uh, what we uh, what we use today came from the ancient societies uh, in terms of philosophy and, and standards and laws and, and things like we haven't developed a lot of this uh, in the last hundred years. Even you know, we're it's just going focused, down. Remember that it's going down. That statement about, yeah, remember that statement about earlier where the single uh, sort of um, syllable, unique syllable words are going down and the ju the, the jewels are going up. You know, the, the one that's going down is that there's there's very little. New, uh, a new thought, new invention, new discovery. But there's a lot of blending of discovery. So there's a lot of people merging and meshing of discoveries and technologies and, yeah. and, and invention. But very few, uh, well, very few, it's going down by a large bit. And it's almost sort of diametrically opposed to each other. So one is exponentially up, that one's down. You know, and, and, and that also says something. So what does that mean? Is, is scientific theory, scientific invention slowing down? No, it's actually not. But it's, it's now becoming – why why is that? And you must ask the question. I come back to why. So why is why are you seeing the downturn, the one that increased the other? Uh, 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 there's different ways. There's different reasons. You can look at the way you're educated. You can look at the way you, you've, you, you've been managed and the society you live in. You can, yeah. you can look at what technology you have available to you. There's, there's very many dimensions, and we'll get to that thinking out of the box thing in a second but okay. you know it's it's that's that's an important dimension so so paul let, let's get to the meat of, of the discussion today then right without any further delay 
What is your definition of lateral thinking? Um, yeah, so lateral thinking for me is uh, 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 around partly thinking out of the box. So that's so we hear this notion often about, uh, Paul, we must think out of the box. Okay, that's great. But I started to ask why. Like, what, what is this box? I, I'm now asking a question. I've yet to find, to find someone, and maybe I must ask you the question, Tab. What is the box in your – when I tell you, think out of the box. What does the box represent? So for so, me, yeah, for me, the box is without thinking the normal boundaries. If I, if I just wake up and what am I doing uh, in, my, in my daily job? Okay, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working with somebody, a, a customer, and he wants a data warehouse solution or he wants, uh, some, some, you know, he wants to do something in the cloud. And the box for me is when I, um, when, when I, when I stick to what, what I do every day. That's the box, you know? So very close, very close uh, okay. to, to what I was about to say. So the box for me, if you imagine a box, box has four sides. Now, if you imagine these four sides being professional, technological, social, personal. Right. And when I say these four things, those are the rules of the game. So let's take a look at professional. You know, the professional side. So what about profit? I have to work within a set of parameters and guidelines and frameworks in, a, in my professional capacity. Does that make sense? Right. So there's a set of rules. There's a set of rules. There's a set of expectations I must adhere to. Like, Paul, don't go to the office not wearing a suit and wearing your, your tackies and flip-flops to a yeah. board meeting. Yeah. So uh, uh, that's what I'm saying. So, and uh, sorry, the, the the personal one is the cultural ones because there's also a cultural dimension to this. So you have these you have these four or five different guardrails. These these sets of the rules. Uh, and and when you start applying all four of these sort of rules together, you get squeezed into a very small box. Okay, you, you don't have a lot of latitude. You, you can't do much because there's a there's a social framework here. There's potentially a religious framework. There's a professional framework, but, but a social on. framework. So, we, we so, we're not trying to break any of those by going out no, of the box. No, no. But here's the thing is, you first of all, you need to understand it exists. Okay. Okay, so so if you don't know it exists, then you can't solve the problem. So first you need to appreciate the fact that there's a set of rules for social, professional, personal, all, the, all those things, like, like, like uh, Steve Jobs did. So once you understand the rules, you can understand what you need to do to work outside of those boundaries that the rules force you in. But if you, if you don't understand the rules, it's another famous quote. You know, if you don't understand the rules of the game, yeah. you can't play the game. Yeah. So, 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 and, and this is what an individual must do. He must understand that there's, there's, there's parameters and there's guardrails that, that, that contain his enthusiasm to do something or not. Uh, and he needs to understand, okay, within that context, how can I use all of these four things in synergy and make sure that I'm outside of the box and not inside the box? Making sure that I'm outside looking in and not inside looking out which is now in a very confined space because now I'm in a very open space. I'm on the other side of the fence. I can do lots here. I've got latitude. I've got movement. But when you're confined to a set of parameters, and by the way, this is exactly the problem I have with data science. You right. talked about data science earlier. So we'll get to that now, why it's important for data science. Because in, in data science, just, just a, a sideline a bit, you know, we, we like to chop off um, the exceptions. We like to chop off the outliers. You know, like, but why do you want to chop out the outliers? There's probably more information that lies in the uh, in the data set with outliers than there is with the data set without outliers. Okay, because you know if the data set didn't have outliers, I pretty much know what the data is. But what's interesting to me are these things sitting on the on the periphery, and I think that's part of the problem we face. We've tried to make our lives so simple, you know, and cut all these things down into nice little neat packages that we actually aren't learning enough because we've yeah. we've we've diluted this thing so far. Uh, uh, it's 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 actually worth nothing. But but why don't you put the effort into the big thing, including the outliers? And the reason why data scientists chop the outliers out because they believe it's going to pollute their results, or they don't have enough compute, or they don't have enough time. There's always a reason why the outliers are hived off. But I'm saying. But that's the wrong way of doing it because the outliers is the pieces of information that you should be interrogating because the, the concentration of, of data and data points in the center, yeah, it's all much the same. And you could probably figure it out and you have an answer to a whole bundle of things. But what's this? Why is this thing sitting on the edge here? Yeah. And, and I want to I want to give you an example of why this type of thinking and lateral thinking is very, very important. In World War II, 
um, where these bombers flew off into Europe and and they, you know they're fighting and they came back and they they were riddled with bullet holes and yeah. and, the, and the one pilot went to the the, the one pilot went off to the, the manufacturing guys and said, guys, we need armor here because we're getting shot out of the sky. So all these guys got together and they said, great, let's put armor. Where shall we put the armor on? Now, they looked at all the planes and they looked at the damage patterns, uh, the bullet hole patterns on all the damaged planes. And they were all focused in a certain space. The guy said, let's put armor there because that's where all the bullet holes are. The guy said, no, 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 no. What you're missing is all the planes that did not come back are the ones that need armor, not the ones that came back. So don't put the armor where you see all the bullet holes. Rather put the armor on, on the opposite side, where there are no bullet holes. Yeah. And and he reversed the thinking. And guess what? It worked. Okay, yeah. and that's what I'm talking about, thinking out of the box. Not always accepting the answer just because it's the collective in the center is the right one. Yeah. Uh, but, sometimes but you have to look at the outlier. My, my question is how you develop that. So, but, but let me just say this first. It's quite amazing. We didn't discuss books. And yet just by by thinking because you know we're exploring the subject naturally in this conversation we got to always ask why and and there was a book start with why and now you're saying focus on the outliers there was a book by malcolm gladwell called outliers and and he the entire book was around what the outliers tell us Yes. Right. And funny enough, I haven't read either of those books. I've not read either one of those books. <laughs> well, you know, I've got this thing where I start reading books. I don't finish them. So, uh, you name a book, and I'll tell you, Paul, I started reading that. <laughs> I just, I just, I, you don't have the time to finish it. Uh, uh, but uh, the World War Two example. Now, now this is. Let, I'm a big believer in making things practical and real. Right. How does somebody develop this skill? Because. Uh, I, 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 if I was standing there in, in World War II, I, you know, I would have been very tempted to say, well, okay, that's where we need the but armor. But it's logic. But, it, yeah. but it's logic. The, 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 you don't look at the planes that came home to say, because oh, those are the ones that survived. Those are not the planes with the problem. It's the planes that didn't come home that's got the problem. So you must assume, if all the bullet holes are in a certain pattern on the planes that came home, then the planes that didn't come home, their bullet holes were different. They, they had a different problem. Okay, but so... If I put a process to it, can, is it is it maybe take the time to explore all scenarios? Don't oh. don't just take the first answer. You know, uh, uh, take some time to think through every scenario. Is that something you can start with? A hundred percent. I think that I think we started this discussion with that. There are more than one ways to skin a cat. There are more than one way to come to an answer in most cases. Okay, that includes mathematics, by the way. So that's not exempt. So this is the and coming, and now we cycle back through the education. We've got to stop teaching, and you asked about the skills. Stop teaching our kids that there is only one possible outcome. Yeah. Because there, there might be many ways to solve a problem, not one. Uh, and, and, and I think, and, and teach them to go, why? You know, be curious. Interrogate what you hear. Interrogate what you see. Interrogate what you read. Not all of it's true. Most of it is lies. In fact, I'd probably hedge a bet that 80 to 90 percent of what you read and see and, and are told is lies okay so you've got to you've got to learn the skill of finding the signal from the noise uh, that, that, and the truth from the lies that's something that's so disappointing because you know I, i'm sure you you were there as well remember in the 90s when the internet first burst onto the scene and sitting here in south africa we now had access to information from all over the world i remember thinking wow imagine where society is going to be because uh, you know, the next generation of kids, by the time they're like 10, they can just access all, all, all these things and have the same knowledge as like an 18-year-old, you know. And it didn't really work that way. In some ways, yeah, with, you can watch a YouTube video and you can learn skills. It's like somebody's there teaching you. But with the amount of fake news, I mean, who, who predicted in 2022 there'd be a rise in flat earthers who, who honestly believe that the earth is flat because they, they see all these memes on social media, I mean, I mean, it's gone wrong, hasn't it? Of course, I, I, that's that's an example of eighty percent of what you hear and see is rubbish. Uh, I, I, that's just another example. Be very clear what you what you hear and see, and does it. And it all comes back to logic. Okay, keep your logical mind. Keep asking why. Interrogate everything. Ask why. You cannot settle for a single answer anymore. There cannot be one answer anymore. There's got to be many answers. And and, and collaboration and and uh, philosophizing is be going to become more of a skill. Uh, you you have to interrogate and ask why. You can't accept it anymore because yeah. you, you, if you accept it, in essence, what you're saying, uh, uh, Tab, is you're accepting 90% of what you read, hear, and, and and speak is wrong. That's what you're accepting. Yeah. Uh, that's the, that's the base. That's the bottom line. 
Uh, and if you're happy with that, great. I'm certainly not happy with with 90% of what I hear uh, and, and 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 see and consume being incorrect. I'm not happy with that. That's that's that. It's way too high for me. So I'm not happy with the 90%. So so you you've got to learn that skill and you've got to teach your 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 children that skill very early because it's going to get worse. Make no mistake. Okay. So if we if we start changing and, and we get our kids thinking this way uh, in an organization, we get our people thinking this way which hopefully should bring more innovation to the organization, and you'll see the Sedgeway, we should be then producing more generalists versus specialists. Don't you want to tell us about generalists, specialists, and maybe complete the picture? Maybe there's, there's, there's a third leg of this. Well, well you see, so that, that's again the old notion of the world. You know, We went through this period of, of, of skills and, and, and what types of people want – called T skills and, and all these other good things. And, you know, we went through a period where specialists are very important. And we want, everybody went out and got deep specialists, PhDs and doctors. And, you know, these guys are the gurus. They're, the gurus and they're very good at a very singular, singular focus uh, dimension. Then we went through, well, no, that's getting too expensive. We can't have 15 PhDs because, you know, we've also got egos, you know, so half the time they're fighting and disagreeing with each other besides getting on with the work because that they, they, they've got PhDs. Everybody thinks they're better than everybody else. So, so, so they're great, but you can't have too many. So then we said, okay, well, we need, we need, a, we need a mix of generalists, you know, throw in a few generalists, which are people with broad competencies, but not necessarily experts at anything. But they can deal with them. they've got they've got ten different skill sets. Okay, they are competent with. Where 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 a PhD guy has got one skill that is a, a master at. So instead of having mastery of one, he's sort of like a generalist. He's got five. And and we went down this thing. And and the world is starting to work in this. You know, evolved in that way over over the last ten or fifteen years. And that was fine up until the fourth industrial age. Up until this new digital mass. Uh, you know, this massive acceleration we've seen. That no longer works anymore because one, you've got no time for specialists because you, uh, there's a skill shortage. It takes too long to train the skills. It's too expensive, et cetera, et cetera. And then you've got the generalists on the other side. Well, they're also a bit of a problem because they're also static in their skills. They've got 10 skills. Well, maybe that's not the 10 skills I want. I want another set of 10 skills. I don't want that 10 skills. I want this 10 skills. Now, we, now we're back into the, 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 the skill shortage game anymore because now we can't find anybody with a set of skills we want. But we, we don't want a specialist because they, you know, so we're starting to see this, This you might say it's a hybrid, okay? We're starting to see this situationist uh, type evolve where where there, there are individuals that are, that are that have learned that could be either. They could be a generalist when they have to be, and they could also be a specialist. Now, how is that possible? I mean, you can't be a specialist and you can't be a generalist. Well, it is because they've learned some other skills that uh, that that uh, that are very pertinent to the digital age they're very closely tied to the digital age uh, and that is this just in time learning this the self-learning this this massive amount of data on the internet that we've just spoken about the youtubes of the world these the, the open universities the the udemy's the linkedin learning there's this massive massive uh, portfolio of, of knowledge now that's available yeah. and what what these sort of situations do is they now become experts at navigating this massive massive domain of knowledge okay and collecting knowledge they require to achieve a certain objective so they they don't need to have 10 years of deep experience in astrophysics to solve a problem they need to know just enough about astrophysics just enough to know about it to solve the problem they're dealing with. They don't need the 10 years of experience. They just need the right amount at the right time to solve the problem. Um, so, so you're seeing this sort of situationist type um, individual uh, brew where he can be a specialist and he can be a generalist because he's adaptile. So what are you talking about the skills? Well, he's, a, he's an adaptive type personality. He's an agile mind. He's, he can learn many things. He's got a thirst for knowledge. He's got a hunger for knowledge. So those types of skills are now starting to shape a new type of a worker, which okay, is this, um, uh, this, uh, this situation. Situ okay, but somebody watching this and, and, and he's just heard that and he loves it. How does the average Joe then become a situationalist? Well, it's the same question you must ask yourself. How does a specialist become a generalist? The problems are the same problems. Just because there's a new thing doesn't mean there's a new answer to the problem. And so in, in generally speaking, a specialist cannot become a generalist, okay? They're just not the same mindset. And it's like asking a professor or a PhD to go and become a generalist in 50 different subjects. Yeah. 
it's it's probably not going to happen because the way he's trained his mind for and how long does it take you to become a doctor get a doctorate i mean 10 15 years and you've got to put in papers and do research he spent an inordinate amount of energy in, in a single um a single-minded focus um a speciality his brain is starts to be wired because he's done it for so long your brain starts being wired to be that so it's not about asking the individual he must now become a, a generalist because he's he studied the same thing for 15 years he's he's the biology of his brain has to change. Yeah. The, the the pathways of thinking and the way he solves the problem has to change. And that's not easy. So it's not easy becoming a, a, a generalist from a specialist or vice versa. Same issue evolves from a generalist to a specialist. The, the, the fundamental way that they learn and they think and they experience changes the the, the, the mapping of the brain. And and that that is the same with the, with, the, with the situationists. You can't just become one. You've got to, the way you start to, to do that is look at the skills that are required that makes a, 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 those types of people and practice it often enough where you can start rewiring the brain. It's not about going to school and learning a new subject. It's not about going to varsity and writing a new paper. It's about exercising the brain uh, in a way that uh, that ultimately would land up with you being this type of person, which is a situationist, yeah. who's open to knowledge, who can absorb different things at different times, can navigate his way through this digital chaos to the the bodies of knowledge that 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 are truth, uh, etc. So you, you you go you don't go to a classroom for that, but the skills and the things that you practice rewire the brain. So lateral thinking, creative, why all of those types of things I've just mentioned all contribute towards rewiring the brain, rewiring your consciousness for, for, for learning. And and it's and this is what people forget. When people think, oh, Paul, because we live in this instant society, yeah, but Paul, I give, I'll just go and learn it at a school, or get a degree, or put some, mm. you know, some thing on my head and push a button and I'm one of them. It's, it's not that anymore. It's, you've, you've, you've got to spend the time in doing it. And it's got to do with the biological uh, uh, brain. It's yeah. not got to do with courses at university and 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 but people want to go do a course but, but there's no course for this there's yeah. no course for this so one of the things i'm doing paul is i find if i book if i force myself to book time in my weekly calendar i put half an hour there half an hour there to uh, focus on, on on consuming this vast amount of knowledge you've got linkedin learning you've got youtube um that that helps but you've got to have a, an end goal in mind you can't do it aimlessly otherwise uh, you know it'll fall apart and then the second part of what you were saying um a lot of people in the it industry the trend now is to just get certified there's all these cloud exams coming uh, or, or we've had them for a while and there's new ones coming every month it seems and uh, so so i was talking to a, a person that was struggling to you know to pass one of these exams and the individual was just, they, they were going on to these sites, LinkedIn Learning and, you know, we've got Microsoft Learning, but they were just reading the material. And you have to do, as you said, you, you, you've got to go and click practice, the mouse. Practice, practice, practice. Practice, yeah. yeah, yeah. So those are the two things, you know, uh, setting aside the time to force yourself, uh, uh, you know, to start consuming this big chunk of knowledge that is there on the internet. I know earlier we said, uh, there's a lot of crap on the internet, but obviously there's a lot of good knowledge as well. And then don't just read. I mean, watching a video, we're, we're so fortunate if you think about it, right? You can watch a video on a topic, something our uh, f fathers, grandparents didn't have. Uh, and you've got almost like a personal tutor showing you. But then you, what you've mentioned, you still have to go and actually do it to complete. Yes, you've got to practice it. The learning, and and yeah. there's, a, there's, there's a great guy that I know. Uh, uh, Dr. Thorm is an is American professor in data science, funny enough, and, and he's he started a, a learning guild, uh, a learning guild, and uh, this is where, where people go to learn and 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 learn using different techniques of learning, uh, going back to the you know the the 13th century techniques of learning, etc. Uh, that's why it's still called a guild. And he had, he's developed this one page which I'm which I'm presenting to my team, which is which is this thing on self learning, and you know, what is, what does it mean? What is, what is the process of self learning? You know this, you know consume, practice, uh, preach, consume. You know, and, and and it's a great thing. And and perhaps we should include that at some point in this in this in this in this video is a is a is a is a view of that. But yeah. but uh, uh, it, it, it talks to the practice. You know, you can't just read it and consume it. You have to go out and practice it. And and 
uh, there's a lot of parallels in there with with, with what I do today. Uh, you know, um, uh, presentations, keynotes, speaking, public speaking, debates. Those are all those are all avenues or mechanisms uh, for one to practice that, 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 what you're saying. You know, it's, it, that, that's the practice dimension of learning, is is actually sitting and teaching, like what we're doing now. This is this yeah. is a learning exercise I mean, for for me for me and I suppose our listeners and our viewers. Uh, it's a learning exercise. So so. Being able to practice something is 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 a very very much an important part of inculcating that 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 wisdom or that expertise in 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 in, in your mind and in, and your philosophy. So yeah. it's not just about reading stuff. You've got, actually got to go out there and do it. But the question is, what is what do I do to practice? Because sometimes it's not hitting a keyboard necessarily. So even that answer can be a bit difficult. It's like, okay, so how do I practice philosophy? Yeah, if well, you yeah tough you know, which is which is different to say well how do i practice building a, a, a data science model yeah so the practice uh, you know the, the how you demonstrate how you exercise that knowledge is 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 going to be a, 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 a simple in some cases and very difficult in the other cases so uh, you, you've got to find a balance between the two but practice in essence is is the key word yeah you've you've got to you've got to get out there and exercise your your knowledge and practice with it yeah. okay so Paul, I mean, we, 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 we need to start wrapping up. So I think in part one, which is this video, we spoke about lateral thinking and what's missing from modern society. The, um, the creative brain, developing the creative brain amongst young people. Uh, you know, we spoke about maybe is the education system uh, missing a trick. Uh, but it's not just about young people. This is something we can bring into the corporate culture. The next video we're going to talk about innovation. So if you enjoyed, if you're still with us, if you enjoyed this one, uh, we have a purpose. It's not, it's not aimless. Assuming I haven't, assuming I haven't put everybody to sleep yet. No, I don't think, yeah. I don't think so. I think, I think there'll be a few people who are very interested, right? How do we then use this uh, lateral thinking, always asking why, uh, uh, you know, looking at the outliers, uh, practicing, you know, trying, trying to, trying to find another answer. Uh, or, or another way to the answer, right? These are some of the skills. So, so we've covered a little bit about it. We haven't just told you what it is. If you apply that, it's going to lead to more innovation. The next video, we will talk about innovation. So, Paul, do you want to just give them a quick teaser of what's coming in the next video? Oh, innovation. So, you know, how is innovation? How do human? How do humans innovate? How do humans uh, 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 in, uh, 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 discover? How do humans invent? And I think uh, if one looks to the past, if one understands evolution, uh, 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 biological evolution, one can potentially perhaps find an answer to the question you ask is how do we innovate? Well, maybe it's an evolutionary thing. Maybe if we look far enough back and we understand the cycles of evolution, we might understand how, how innovation happens um, in that context. So, a little bit of innovation, a little bit of history, a little bit of uh, uh, biological innovation. Uh, evolution should be a, a hot topic next uh, next time we sit together and have a chat. But Perfect. Yeah, yeah, I think that's going to be good, right? So just to wrap up, uh, so viewers, a bit of a long video, but I hope you enjoyed uh, the topic, lateral thinking. For some of you, it would be new. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's really, it, it makes a lot of sense. And it's something that you feel you knew already, but deep down have have we explored it why haven't we explored it right and there's so much content here uh paul and i can can come back to this topic uh in future because there's just there, it feels like there's just more to talk about right so that's that's it for part one lateral thinking and part two will be around taking that and moving then into innovation which should be the result if we can bring about this change uh in in our corporate culture and society uh, and all of perfect so viewers hope you enjoyed that uh leave some comments down uh you know and and we'll, we'll, we like interacting with you guys and look out for part two in this series which is all about innovation coming fairly soon so until then have a good day and we'll see you really soon